Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in the lecture theatre here, and also, of course, if you're watching online. Uh, my name's Alistair McGrath, and I'm the Gresham Professor of Divinity. And in this lecture, the fourth of my final year as Gresham Professor, I want to look at this question, which I think some of you will find depressing, some of you will find stimulating, perhaps some of you will also find interesting. And that is, you know, if we are so great, why is this world such a mess? And it's an interesting question. Obviously, I'll be giving you some of my ideas, but of course, I'll be bringing lots of other people into the conversation as well. And in many ways, the important thing is not what I think, but actually what you think. In many ways, I'm giving you lots of ideas to reflect on, to see if they make any sense, and see where you might take it from them. So basically, here's the question we're going to be thinking about in this lecture. If human beings are so wonderful, and I think we like to think we are, then why do we seem to make such a mess of things. I think it's something that we, we always reflect on. Very often in the history you find there are periods of great optimism, then they give way to periods of great pessimism. You might think, for example, of the Roaring Twenties, when most Americans were very happy to buy into the general optimism of that age. And of course, as you know, um, basically the stock markets, like the world, seem to be going upwards. And then, of course, uh, the bubble burst. And the Wall Street crash triggered a financial crisis in Germany, which, of course, gave Adolf Hitler the political impetus he needed to get elected, with the result that by 1934, Germany had actually turned Nazi. So I think there are some very interesting questions here. And I think that in many ways, um, events like the First World War, the Second World War, even more recent events, I think give us a good opportunity just to revisit this question, the question of human nature. And what I want to do is explore this general question. I'm sure some of you will feel it's perhaps a rather pointless thing to do. Isn't it really about introversion, looking at ourselves, when there's so much in the world that really deserves our attention? And I think that's a very fair point. But it's also, I think, a good point to ask whether there's something about us which means we might be contributing to the problems in some way or some form. And so what I want to do is begin to explore with you some of these issues about human nature. Now, some of you will know this man is William Hazlitt, a very well-known um, essayist. And in one of his essays, he reflects on the question that I'm putting before you this afternoon. And it's this. He writes, man is the only animal that laughs and weeps. For he is the only animal that is struck with the difference in what things are and what they ought to be. Now, I think that's a great quote, because in many ways what Hazlitt is doing is saying we need to have this, this vision of the way things ought to be. And then we look at the way things are, and we see the disparity, the dissonance between the vision and the reality. And the question I like to ask is actually, where do we get this idea that things could or should be better from? In other words, we look at the world and we feel it should be better than this. Well, where does that idea come from? And what sort of uh, directions does it point in? And of course, there are those who would say, well, you know, fun human nature is fundamentally good. We, we do good things. And I'm sure we'd like to try to do good things, and perhaps even we do do some good things from time to time but it does seem to be a rather uneven picture. I mean, from a Christian perspective, of course, you have this idea of sin, which is very much about a, a sort of brokenness in human nature, which means we are unable to rise to the challenges that we feel are there, or indeed even when recognizing what good is, to actually be able to achieve that good. And some of you will know Tennyson's very famous words in his poem, Guinevere. And let me read this to you. I think these words are very optimistic, maybe even naive, but I'm interested to know what you think. Here are the words. We needs must love the highest when we see it. I'll read that again. We needs must love the highest when we see it. And I sometimes wish that were true, but I have to say I'm not really sure it is. There's something about us that I think makes us recognize good things, but then perhaps go and do something else. Now, many of you will know a very famous letter of Lord Acton, dated from 1887, in which he wrote that power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, obviously, Acton might be wrong, but uh, many would say this man has put his finger on something that's really important. 
He drew the conclusion, as you see, that great men are almost always bad men. Um, but I think that it, is, it is a very important idea. And in fact, this, this anxiety really lies behind the tendency in most Western democracies to try and eliminate power being concentrated in one individual's hands. And I think that is a very important point to make. And certainly, you'll know that the British Prime Minister, William Pitt, many years ago, made a, a, a further point which I think is relevant here. He wrote, unlimited power is apt to corrupt the minds of those who possess it. And I think that there's a very interesting point being made here, but I, I want to raise with you a question. Don't you think that Acton and Pitt here are really saying, look, human nature is fundamentally good and benign, and then power comes along and that good nature gets corrupted? In other words, we are innocent, then power comes along and that corrupts us. What if there's something already within us which actually leads us to express our true nature through power? And when we express that, it tends to be something really quite worrying. And some of you will know there's a very ancient Anglo-Saxon proverb. There's a collection of them up in um, Durham Cathedral. And this proverb runs like this. Man does as he is when he can do what he wants. Again, man does as he is when he can do what he wants. And the point being made there is that really it's when we can do anything we like, when there are no limitations on us, that we show the way we really are. And many of you will know that a better version of that quote, of course, from Abraham Lincoln in this very telling phrase. If you want to test a man's character, give him power. And the point here, which is, I think is really interesting, is that Abraham Lincoln is not saying power corrupts. He's saying power exposes. Power actually shows up what we are really like. And that is, I think, a very interesting thought, because if Lincoln is right, then power, if you like, is almost like a, a mirror of the soul, a kind of diagnostic test which shows up what we are really like. And I think that the disturbing thing about most of us is that actually we don't entirely realize what we are really like until we are put in a situation where those limits are finally removed. And of course, uh, I'll be talking later about William Golding's novel, Lord of the Flies, but that's a good example of a piece of literature that explores that possibility and reflects on what it says about human nature. We might indeed long to be good, and I'm sure we all do, but so often that we don't seem to actually be able to deliver that and very often end up in a different place. So how can we make sense of this gulf between, to quote from Hazlitt, what we would like things to be and the way they actually are? And I think it's very important to make the point that human history seems to be littered with bright hopes which seem to turn into dismal failures. Now, of course, it doesn't always happen, but it happens a lot of times. And that, I think, is the sort of thing that makes us ask these questions. I mean, there are many technological developments and inventions which actually could enhance the quality of human life. But very often, these technological developments are used to make better weapons. And so there is a concern there, I think, about these tools at our disposal, which can be used for good or for ill, and we don't always, I think, use them rightly. So how do we make sense of this? Why is it that human nature seems, if I can put it like this, to destroy paradise? Well, many of you, I think, will know the works of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who rose to fame as one of the great dissidents of the Soviet Union, calling into question both its history and also its present-day manifestations. And the Gulag Archipelago, I think, is one of his finest works, because, as you will know, it exposes a system of forced labor, exile, and oppression. So where is the problem? I know, why did this happen? I think on a very naive reading of things, you'd expect Solzhenitsyn to say, well, of course, the problem here is Marxist-Leninist ideology. That really is the problem. Or maybe it's a Soviet Communist Party. Yet while Solzhenitsyn, I'm sure, saw those as possible contributions to the problem, he actually saw the problem as lying deeper. 
And here are some words that Solzhenitsyn gave when he spoke at Harvard some time ago. I'm going to read these two and see what you make of them. He writes, if only it were all so simple. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being and who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart. Now, again, that's very provocative, but I think he raises what is a very fair and very interesting question. He's saying, look, it's so easy to say, I'm good, and there are the bad people. And Solzhenitsyn is saying, look, we may need to recognize that actually that sort of dichotomy exists within each of us. And maybe what we can do then is try and control the darker side and make sure that we express the brighter side in who we are and what we do. But this thought, I think, really is important. I'm not saying we, we should be pessimistic about human nature. I'm just saying we should be realistic. In other words, try and look at some of these questions and see what difference it makes to the way we think. So let's move away from Solzhenitsyn. Let's look uh, at uh, the Italian playwright Giuseppe Baretti, uh, who's best known for a play in which he made... Uh, uh, Galileo say these words, epo si muove, it's, yet it still moves, which of course Galileo didn't say, but uh, Beretti wrote a rather nice play about Galileo in which he put those words into his mouth. But during their grand tour of Europe in 1765-6, to six, uh, Samuel Johnson and his biographer James Boswell met with Beretti, and they, they seem to have had a great time together, and they really got on very well. And one of the questions they came to was discussing the issue of human nature. And Beretti has a one liner which I think is really interesting, and here it is. He says, I hate mankind, for I think myself one of the best of them, and I know how bad I am. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a nice little quote. I mean, he's basically saying, look, you know, I think I'm pretty good by human standards, but I have to admit uh, you know, how bad I am. So it's a witty remark, which I think is spoken largely in jest, but it does, I think, open up this question of human nature. And maybe this question was underexplored during the Victorian age. I mean, there are reasons why this might have been the case. For example, there was a virtual absence of a global conflict between the period 1815 to 1914. That's a long time without a major global conflict. And maybe that lulled people into a false sense of security. That you we were entering into a period of relative tranquility. We'd gone through the business of living, making money, and so on. Yet, of course, as we all know, the global explosion of war and destruction in the 20th century made it very clear that actually we're perfectly capable of doing this sort of thing again. So how can we cope with this darker side of humanity? What sort of conceptual frameworks can we use that might help us to make sense of it and even to do something about it? And I think there are five ways in which you can kind of move away from this problem. I'm going to say we need to face up to it, but there are five strategies that people tend to use, in effect, to just say there isn't really a problem here at all. Let me tell you what these five strategies are and see whether this makes sense of you. One solution, of course, is to say, look, there isn't a problem at all. Any suggestion there's a, a flaw or a defect in humanity is basically, you know, irrational nonsense. Um, and so we, we sanitize our language to persuade ourselves that our flaws and our failings are actually virtues and strengths. So that's one way. Say, look, there isn't a problem. We don't need to worry about this. Or, secondly, what we can do is to ignore history or present the historical narrative in a, such a selective and reassuring way that disconfirming evidence is simply airbrushed out of the picture, rather like, actually, the way in which disgraced Soviet leaders were airbrushed out of pictures or replaced with potted palms um, during the 1920s. <laughs> or, thirdly, what you could say is, you know, well, look, being good and being human are the same. In other words, human beings are good by definition, and therefore to be good is simply to be human. And I'm sure that is 
uh, the beginnings of a way of thinking about this. But I think that we do need to ask whether we need something more robust than that, which is saying maybe there is this dichotomy, this tension between what we do and what we know we could do or know we should do. In other words, that we need to transcend the limits of what we presently do and do better than that. Or fourthly, we might suggest that um, good and evil are simply social constructions without any basis in an objective reality. In other words, whether we think that we are good or bad or whether we think that somebody else or something else is good or bad really depends on the pre-commitments and prejudices of those who are judging rather than the qualities of those who are being judged. And if that was so, of course, then good or evil would simply be the observer imposing this moral framework on other people. In other words, this is, in effect, not an objective statement about the real world, but simply somebody expressing an opinion about people they very often don't like very much. But there's a fifth category, which I think is the most dangerous, and I'm sure as I describe this, you'll recognise this. It's the, 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 the approach that Solzhenitsyn warns against, and it's this. By declaring that humanity can be separated into two categories, good people and evil people, And it's those evil people who are responsible for the evils of our world, whereas, of course, the good people embody everything that is bright and hopeful and right. And, of course, the problem is that we automatically put ourselves in that category of good people, which is very flattering, of course. But the problem is that it ends up creating in-groups and out-groups. And it really could lead to the very disturbing suggestion that those who are placed in that group of evil people should be marginalised or eliminated, which I think is a very disturbing trend. So I'm going to suggest is that we, we don't try to evade this problem. We just say, look, there seems to be something here that really is worth engaging with. We, as human beings, are perfectly capable of doing good. We're perfectly capable of doing, doing evil. And unfortunately, we're very good at taking some good things and doing some pretty bad things with them. And I think, you know, if we look at the two areas in which I specialise myself, both science and religion, I mean, they can do some pretty good things, but they can also go wrong. I think it's very important to emphasise that point. These things can go wrong. That doesn't mean that they are bad. It just means they are both thoroughly human undertakings. And that means that because we're human beings, we get caught up in all kinds of power dynamics, and very often these things go wrong. But maybe the problem goes deeper than this, because there there are many who would say, well, look, maybe we do do evil from time to time, but it's accidental. We don't quite know what we're doing. If we had known, we wouldn't have done it. And I'm sympathetic to that. But actually, you know, I think we need to face up to the issue that some people, knowing that something is wrong, still do it. And again, that, that line from Tennyson that many of you will know, we needs must love the highest when we see it, which I quoted earlier. I mean, it does seem to be to be a little bit naive that in many ways the problem is that we, are, um, we almost seem to be able to see things and instead of loving them, say, what's in this for me? How can I exploit this? Think, for example, of the exploitation of beautiful rainforests and things like that. So there are deeper and more difficult questions here. So it seems to me that there are some important questions to look at here. And one problem I'd like to raise with you is whether we seem to lack a vocabulary which is adequate to describe this complexity with human nature. In other words, if we're saying, look, evil is not located in other people who we dislike, but actually might be something that is within us and expresses itself if we find ourselves in certain situations under pressure, then, of course, we have to ask what can be done about that. And, of course, you will all have read novels or seen movies where the central theme is somebody is placed in a situation, a very difficult situation, and as a result, they start to do things which... They wouldn't normally do at all, and they get locked into darker and darker patterns of behaviour. 
I don't know if you, like uh, me, are, are wondering what to do with Sunday evenings anymore because now McMafia has finished. But those of you who watched that, you know, you'll know the point I'm getting at, how somebody gets sucked into something and gets more and more sucked in to violence, to corruption, all these things. And you keep wondering, is he actually going to break free from this? Or is he just going to get more and more entangled? And that, I think, is the kind of question we have to wrestle with, that sometimes we just find ourselves out of our depth. And Solzhenitsyn's experiences in the Soviet labor camp led him to realize, again, that quote I gave you, that the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And Solzhenitsyn is asking us to, in effect, stop and pointing the figure at someone else and look at ourselves instead. So that brings me to this novel, which I know many of you will have read. Um, I suspect, like some of you, I, um, I was forced to read this novel at school. Uh, and I found it awful. And then, of course, when I actually read it again later, I thought, this is really rather good. Um, but I didn't actually appreciate when I was forced to read it. But those of you who've read that book will, will know the rich issues that it opens up. For those of you who haven't read it, it's about um, a group of British schoolboys in the 1950s who are stranded on an isolated island in a remote region of the Pacific Ocean uh, as a result of an aeroplane crash. And basically, the, the, the kids survive, and they start to figure out how to live on this island. And they set up the rudiments of civilization, and then things begin to go wrong. There's violence. There's all kinds of depravity. And basically, it's a story of dysfunctionality, in effect, things going wrong. Social norms are left to one side. Basically, the situation, to use that phrase from Abraham Lincoln, actually shows us up for who we really are. Now, obviously, you really need to read this novel to actually appreciate the rich of Golding's analysis. But one of the points he brings out is that very often our, our, our sense of good is only skin deep. And when we're put in a situation where more complex forces are there, we begin to behave in a rather different way. So what is going on here? I think one of the very interesting questions we can ask is whether there is something about us which, in effect, gives us the, the capacity to almost choose who we are. And that's a great theme of the Renaissance. And some of you will know a very interesting piece of writing that dates from the time of the Renaissance. And it's by um, Giovanni Pico della Mionda. I'll put it up on the screen in a moment. It's called The Oration on the Dignity of Humanity and was given in 1486. And basically, um, um, this, this powerful orator um, rewrites the creation narratives of the book of Genesis. And what he does is to accentuate the creativity of humanity. And the, the idea he develops is this. In creating humanity, God gives human beings the capacity to choose where they would like to be placed in the realm of possibilities inside the created order. And so basically, he, he, the narrative, it's very improbable, it's very interesting. He's saying, look, um, because humanity was the last thing to be created, when humanity was created, all the existing categories were used up. And therefore, God gave humanity as the right to, in effect, choose what it would be. And here's the quote in which he develops this. this again, this is, a, this is his rewriting of the Genesis creation narrative. Some of you may find this um, rather annoying, but what I want to do is look at the approach he's developing. We've given you, Adam, neither a fixed dwelling place nor a form that is yours alone, nor any function that is peculiar to you alone. This is so that you may have and possess whatever dwelling place, form, and functions you yourself may desire according to your longing and judgment. The nature of all other beings is limited and constrained within the bounds of laws prescribed by us. But you are constrained by no limits and shall determine the limits of your nature for yourself in accordance with your own free will 
in whose hand we have placed you. Now, what I want you to do is just go with this imaginative experiment. In other words, say, look, um, this isn't what the Genesis creation narrative says, but let's just go with this idea. What's the point he's making? And the point he's making is that actually we choose whether we reach up to become angels or reach down to become like the beasts of the field. And he's simply making this unsettling point that if our identity is indeterminate, then we end up choosing the kind of creatures we're going to be. And obviously, he, he is setting before his audience the aspiration to reach for the angelic, to in effect show those qualities of goodness and integrity and all the rest of them. But he's saying also, but some of you will be going downwards because that's what you want to do and that's what you want to be. And while I have a lot of misgivings about this, I think actually it's a very interesting approach. And his standout point really is that we have the capacity to determine who we are or what we might become. And of course, if there is a darker side to our nature, then you can see that this really opens up ways of helping us to understand what is going on. And some of you may know G.K. Chesterton's words. Uh, some years ago he wrote, when once one begins to think of man as a shifting and alterable thing, it's always easy for the strong and crafty to twist him into new shapes. In other words, that you know, we, we can be redirected by those in power for their own purposes. And again, many, many of you will have read Aldous Huxley's book, Brave New World, from 1932, in which he actually begins to map out what this dysfunctional and deeply unsettling world might look like. So one of the points I'm raising is whether we have a reluctance to actually ask these difficult questions about ourselves. And Rowan Williams, used to be Archbishop of Canterbury, once remarked, and I quote, that there is inbuilt into human beings a sort of dangerous taste for unreality. I said again, there's inbuilt into human beings a sort of dangerous taste for unreality. And the point that Williams is making is that very often we kind of way close our eyes to evidence that suggests all is not well, and just focus on the evidence that says all does indeed seem to be well. And Williams is really saying we need to look at the darker things as well as those that actually seem to fit with our preconceived ideas. So, Rowan Williams is interesting, but one of the most interesting books written in the last 15 or so years is the philosopher John Gray's book, Straw Dogs. Again, John Gray, Straw Dogs. And it's a very interesting book. And, and, and indeed, if you read it, you, you'll find it very unsettling. But it's a kind of unsettling book that makes you glad you've read it because it opens up all sorts of ideas. And it's a, an iconoclastic book. Uh, it debunks the pretensions of a kind of um, bland humanist philosophy, which just says, you know, all is well, don't worry about it. And Gray, you know, is very, very aggressive. He's saying we need to face up as human beings to difficult truths. Listen to this. Human beings cannot live without illusion. And, you know, what sort of illusion does he have in mind? He's saying, well, maybe religion's an illusion. Maybe politics is an illusion. Maybe our belief that we are good is an illusion. But he's saying we need these illusions to cope with life. Now, that's unsettling. I'm not um, entirely sure I agree with him, but it's a very interesting point. He argues that um, any belief in moral progress is a superstition, his word, which is basically at a distance from the way things really are. And he argues that there's something about us which means that we reach for the latest technology and use it to do all kinds of things that reinforce the positions of the powerful. And here is um, a quote from his work that will give you a, an indication of its tone. I expect most of you, like me, will, will disagree with this, but there is just enough truth in this to make it worth thinking about. Listen to this. Without the railways, telegraph, and poison gas, there could 
have been no holocaust. And I think the point he's trying to make, um, maybe he overmakes it, but it, the point he's making is basically that we invented these things and we use them to express who we are. And some of us use them in deeply disturbing ways. And maybe we who are judging those might be those who do those things ourselves one day. So it's a very unsettling thought. And in place of these illusions, what Gray calls them, uh, Gray himself offers a ruthlessly Darwinian account of human nature, which in effect says we are, we are powerless to become masters of our own destiny. We're controlled by forces which we ourselves cannot control. And his point is that we have to learn to live with this. Now, many would say, well, look, there may be a point here, but it is being overstated. And I would be in that group of people, I think. But nevertheless, I've got to say there seems to be something here that is worth thinking about. Here's another overstatement. Again, you know, easily, I think, critiqued. But nevertheless, it needles us because there's just enough truth in it to make us say, well, I think he's overstated, but there is something here. Listen to this. Human beings are weapon-making animals with an unquenchable fondness for killing. Now, I think that's an exaggeration. But I have to say to you, every now and then I see something and I say, I wonder if he actually was making a fair point there. So what might religion have to say about this? Well, I think there are some interesting ideas we could explore here. And as you would expect, I'm going to touch on this idea of sin, which seems to me to be a word that some of us are reluctant to use, but actually it's, a, it's very hard to avoid using this word precisely because there seems to be something about us as human beings which fits into this broad category. So let me explain in general terms what a, a theological notion of sin is like. It really is used to designate a flaw within human nature, which prevents us from achieving our true goals. It's not really a moral idea. It may become a moral idea, but actually it's more a sort of religious idea in it's saying that if our relationship with God is damaged, this leads to all kinds of outcomes. And certainly we can use the word sin to designate um, individual actions, which uh, represent a failure to achieve our true goal, and also to the underlying human state, which gives rise to those individual acts of sin in the first place. So if you like the sin as actions, the sin is an underlying condition. Or to switch the analogy to a more medical analogy, you could say that maybe sin is the illness, which gives rise to individual sins as symptoms of that illness. And if that is so, then of course, you know, there's a limit to, to the utility of saying stop doing that when, if we use this medical model, we require to be cured of what is that causes us to do this in the first place. And certainly classic writers like Augustine of Hippo in the 4th and 5th centuries argue that human being can be seen as damaged or wounded or broken. In other words, that we are impaired that we need healing and restoration if we are to achieve our true aspirations and goals. And what Augustine is saying is that actually, although we think we are free, we are actually constrained and shaped by influences we don't fully understand or appreciate. And so think we're acting freely, whereas in fact we are um, you know, acting on the basis of complex forces that we don't understand, such as, well, let me give you three, um, our evolutionary past, our personal weaknesses, or by the seductive whispers of delusions that have become the received wisdom of our day. So as I said, I think you know, if we didn't have that word sin, we'd end up inventing it because there is a need to find some sort of vocabulary to try and describe this tension we see within human nature. And again, staying on this theological side of things, you could say that, uh, that, that human beings bear the image of God and are sinful. The image of God, if you like, is drawing us upwards to make us yearn to do good things, to yearn to be better people, and yet there is something within us 
which seems to drag us down and in effect frustrates that those desires for goodness that we feel find within us. And again, many of you will recognize that kind of thing, you know, longing to do something, yearning to do it, and yet just finding that, you know, the, you know, the, the, the spirit may be willing, but the flesh is weak. There's a real problem there in actually trying to do it. And so if the image of God affirms our need to reach upwards, to grasp and be grasped by God, then the notion of sin talks about a darker reality, namely our tendency to be drawn and be dragged down. Now, of course, many would say, well, this idea of sin needs to be critiqued. I mean, many philosophers in 18th century France felt it was an insult to human dignity. Uh, It's suggesting that human beings were flawed and fallible, prone to selfishness and violence. But I have a feeling that, you know, this may be rather over-defensive, that actually maybe there is something here that we need to take very, very seriously. Because one of the great uh, concerns that a number of political philosophers have, John Gray uh, is one of those who's concerned about this, is that if we have idealized views of human nature, we will also have idealized views of society. And we get frustrated because we cannot achieve them, and therefore we decide to achieve them in our own ways. And of course, that is really quite, uh, uh, quite unacceptable. So I think there are issues to look at here. I think that the idea of sin really is important. And of course, the point I'm going to make is that, you know, this narrative, this framework, I think is quite helpful in answering difficult questions. And here is a difficult question, which I think we need to think about. Why is it that every human institution seems to subvert its own goals. Let me read that to you again and see what you think about this. Why is it that every human institution seems to subvert its own goals? I mean, look, let me give you an example. The Christian church um, regularly falls victim to social forces and pressures, such as, for example, the need to accumulate financial resources. And in the pursuit of those resources, Many would say, and I think I'd be very sympathetic to this, actually lose sight of, or perhaps even even lose altogether, the original vision which drives it. That's That's a real concern. Countless institutions, whether they are religious or secular, find themselves collapsing or failing through human flaws. For example, um, take... um, the uh, recent situation where the United Nations sent peacekeeping forces to protect vulnerable communities in Africa, Sierra Leone and elsewhere. What happened? Well, those troops ended up raping and abusing local women and gave rise to a new social phenomenon, the so-called peacekeeper babies. And Ban Ki-moon, who was then a UN Secretary General, described this, um, this sexual abuse as a cancer in our system. And I think that's a very powerful statement of this. And again, you know, you've seen the newspapers recently, you know, I'm sure you're all as disturbed and perplexed as I am by the scandal of Oxfam and other humanitarian agencies that work in disaster zones, such as Haiti. And, you know, part of me says, you know, why did they do that? And yet another part of me says, you know, maybe there is something in human beings, all of us, which might lead us to do that kind of things and we need to be very, very careful and ask what can we do to rein that kind of thing in. But let me go back to that quote from Ban Ki-moon who talked about um, the behavior of UN peacekeepers as a cancer in our system. Because what I want to do here is quote to you from the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr. And he basically says, look, There are flaws in human institutions. There are flaws in human society. But we so often say, that's society. Whereas I'm an individual. I'm kind of way, I'm good. Society's bad. And Niebuhr was saying, no, no, I'm sorry. The problem lies partly in you. He writes, um, the flaws in human institutions arise from corresponding flaws in human nature itself. To use Ban Ki-moon's phrase, the cancer doesn't just lie in the system, but in the individual human beings that make it up. 
And actually, that's one of the reasons why Reinhold Niebuhr, who became very interested in politics, was so respectful of the American constitutional system, precisely because it had so many checks and balances intended to stop any one person from becoming all-powerful and able to do things. Everything had to be checked. And I think that's a very important point. Niebuhr thought we had to develop workable means of preventing the excessive concentration of power. So I think there are some very interesting points here. I'm not in any way saying that we are pessimistic about human nature or indeed our potentials. I'm saying we do need to say there are these darker sides to things and we need to incorporate this into our thinking to make it realistic and informed. So that is a point I want to emphasize. Now obviously there's a lot more that I could say about this. And one of the points I could make, which I think would take a lot longer to make than I have time for, is to explore how this idea of sin, in effect, is not to be seen as something that causes us to be pessimistic, but simply something that says to us, let's face up to who we are. It's a bit like a doctor saying to you, I'm sorry, the medical condition you have is this, and it is affecting the way you behave, but there is something that can be done about this. Let's see if we can work on this. But I haven't really enough time to explore this. So what I'm going to do is turn to a moral philosopher that many of you will know, and that is Iris Murdoch. Iris Murdoch is a rare example of an outstanding moral philosopher who writes novels. And actually, one of the reasons she wrote novels is that she felt it was in real-life situations described in novels that you really began to be able to grasp the difficulties individual human beings face in being good in a complex and messy world. And again, remember I picked up on that novel, very well-known novel, um, Lord of the Flies, precisely because that's the literary form it takes. It explores these deep philosophical and theological issues using a story that engages you and helps you to enter into the mindset of the actors in the story. And one of Murdoch's central themes is this. We find it very, very difficult to face up to our own failings. We prefer to construct a facade or a narrative in which we are heroes or heroines or the good guys, whereas in reality, the darker side is there and is not being addressed. Murdoch says that all humanity is characterized by its tendency to deceive ourselves. And she suggests that we are imprisoned within a cocoon of our own making, which makes us blind to the way things really are, above all, the way we really are. And thus, for Murdoch, moral philosophy is about challenging human um, self-deceptions. So here's what she says, and, and again, you know, I think this is quite good, but you know, see what you make of it. Um, Murdoch here is simply making this point that we, we like to think we look at the world and we see ourselves as we really are, whereas in fact very often we're looking at ourselves through rose-tinted glasses. By opening our eyes, we do not necessarily see what confronts us. Our minds are continually active, fabricating an anxious, usually self-preoccupied, often falsifying veil, which partially conceals the world. And Murdoch is saying our task, our job, our responsibility is to learn to see ourselves and the world as it really is. Now, she doesn't use language of sin, but she's using ideas that are very similar to this and simply saying that maybe we cannot do this at the level of society as a whole, but we can do it individually by trying to, in effect, break free from our own self-absorption, self-preoccupation, always asking what's in it for us. And again, it's an interesting idea. So looking at that, you'll say, well, that's, that's all very well, but what can we do? What is it that is going to help us to, to break free from this falsifying veil that Murdoch talks about? Well, let me give you her answer. I, I, I quite like this answer, but I'm not sure how realistic it is. Basically, Iris Murdoch says it is good art 
good art that helps us break free from our own deceptions and um, preoccupations. A good work of art, he says, in effect brings us out of ourselves and enables us to critique ourselves and become the better people we're meant to be. And I, I think I can see what she says, and I have met people who have said that they were really helped to move on by reading a particular novel or by looking at some um, very helpful picture but I'm not sure that everyone would find this experience quite as helpful or quite as transformative as Iris Murdoch obviously did. For, for Murdoch, great art, and this is a quote from Murdoch, shows us the world as we were never able so clearly to see it before. In other words, it's like a lens which allows us to focus in, to see things more clearly than would otherwise be the case. And so Murdoch's argument is that our tendency for self-deception can be broken by the imaginative or moral power of great art, which allows us to see ourselves from outside and self-created webs of meaning. So I think there are some interesting ideas here. But again, I am slightly skeptical. I think that we may need more than that. But nevertheless, she is right, surely, to say we need to ask what means do we have for breaking free from something that seems to prevent us from achieving what we really are meant to be. So let's move on because we're going to come back to that right at the end of this lecture and look at this real problem of um, one possible answer to this. Murdoch sees this as a possible answer but art is a preferred answer. The other answer of course is education. It's by educating people that you enable them to catch a vision of something bigger, that you give them an alternative way of seeing things, a different set of moral values, and that, of course, is transformative. And I, all of us, I think, will be very, very sympathetic to that. That, in effect, it's about trying to give people a new vision of reality. But again, I do want just to exercise caution. And I'm going to take up a theme which um, George Steiner, the well-known philosopher, picked up on in a series of lectures about 20 years ago. And Steiner was reflecting on something very, very somber and sinister. He was thinking about Nazi death camps. And he was thinking about the people who operated those. And he was thinking about their backgrounds. Listen to what he says. This is his reflection. Um, we know that a man can read Goethe or Rilke in the evening, that he can play Bach and Schubert and go to his day's work at Auschwitz in the morning. Now, what Steiner was picking up on was this, in his view, and of course this was his, his own background, I mean, Germany was the most cultured of nations. And yet this had come out of that. How? What went wrong? And in effect, he was, he was reduced to despair that a nation which invested so heavily in good education at, at secondary and tertiary levels seemed to produce people like this capable of doing these things. And his point, I think, is important. Now, I have to say, I personally doubt if many of those running these death camps did read Goethe uh, or, or were even capable of playing Bach or Schubert. But you know, you can see the problem he's trying to get at. That in effect, German poetry and music, which were emblematic of culture and civilization, failed to humanize. And that, I think, is really the issue I'm exploring with you in this lecture. How can we humanize ourselves? By which I mean, how can we become the people we're really meant to be? And Murdoch might say it's through great art. If we were to take a perspective of Christian theology, it would be through redemption, through the moral vision of Christ or through a love of God, which energizes us and helps us to break free from self-preoccupation, self-absorption, and actually do some good things in the world. Or it might indeed come partly through education, which helps us, I think, to see things. The difficulty simply being that there are other things that do indeed drag us down. So here is Bertrand Russell. 
uh, philosopher who I, I greatly admire. Um, he writes beautifully. And this is Bertrand Russell in what I'm afraid is a rather somber mood. Uh, he, is, he emigrated to America during the Second World War, and he was looking with despair at what was happening in Europe, what was happening in Japan, and what was happening in America around him. And he wrote these words, and you could almost sense the desperation, the sheer um, disillusionment here. Man, he writes, is a rational animal. So at least I've been told. Throughout a long life, I've looked diligently for evidence in favor of the statement. But so far, I have not had the good fortune to come across it. Uh, I mean, he writes beautifully, doesn't he? Um, uh, but the point he's making is that there seems to be something about us. You know, if you think, for example, of Cold War rationality in the late 1950s, the only way to stop a hot war was, in effect, by being able to assure the other party that if they fired first, they would be annihilated um, with a, a salvo fired in return. And again, Russell was reduced to despair about this. Is human moral decision-making being reduced to this kind of rational calculus? So that really is the issue I've been exploring in this letter, uh, this lecture. Sorry. And, of course, the point I'm trying to make is that we need to think about human nature ourselves and corporate gatherings of people. And obviously, I've offered you a number of approaches. I've looked at the religious approach. And you may, have, as I've been talking, have thought, some of you, of a passage from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, which actually captures this dilemma quite well. I can will what is right, but I can't do it. For I don't do the good I want, but the evil I don't want is what I do. And you can almost sense the frustration. And the, the key question then is, who will set me free from this body? Who's going to, in effect, break this power? so I can become the person I'm really meant to be. And, of course, for Paul, that is through um, the whole idea of redemption. So in this lecture, I've raised a lot of questions. I'm going to end the quote from, from um, Ovid. This is from his Metamorphosis, and the point I'm making is that the kind of ideas I've been exploring with you aren't new. They're not pessimistic. They're kind of the wisdom of the human race, that we need to try and figure out how to deal with ourselves. And look at this. I see and approve of the better, but I follow the worse. And that seems to me to be a very fitting way of ending this lecture, simply to say there is um, there's a problem here. But, you know, if you realize there's a problem, that might help you do something about it. So... Uh, let me just tell you that the next lecture is on 27th of March, and then I should be asking, how is it that we can fit into this universe? How can we feel at home in a vast, complex universe? What do we mean in that context? Again, I'll be throwing lots of ideas at you just to see what you think. The important thing is not what I think, but the kind of way what you think, and I'm trying to catalyze you in your thinking. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening.